from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today, K-State's Kelsey Anderson and Sarah Lancaster will join us. They'll talk about reports of spring-emerged volunteer wheat turning up around Kansas now and whether that will create a renewed threat of wheat streak mosaic disease infesting the developing wheat crop. They'll cover the best means of ridding of that volunteer, if necessary. And Sarah will go over the herbicide options available to you wheat growers to contend with weed competition now showing up in your stands in alignment with the stage of wheat crop growth. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raven Cloyd will report on several insect pests now at work on landscape woody ornamentals and how to control them. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for listening in once again for Agriculture Today, our Thursday edition. And we'll devote time today to several angles on pest management for those wheat stands out there. On the weed and disease fronts in particular, we're getting word from the country now that uh, volunteer wheat may be flourishing in some parts of Kansas. And this isn't left over from last fall. This is spring emerged volunteer And we are all familiar with what that might mean in the way of wheat disease transmission from history past. We want to talk about that and have brought in two individuals to discuss dealing with volunteer wheat in the springtime. Joining us is wheat disease specialist Kelsey Anderson and weed management specialist Sarah Lancaster, both of K-State Research and Extension. Kelsey, to you, first of all. We know of the relationship of volunteer wheat and a key disease that inflicts our wheat stands virtually every year. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about um, volunteer wheat, probably the first thing we're thinking about, hopefully, is managing wheat streak mosaic virus. And that is so, so important, especially in the summer months when we have wheat that's maturing, drying down, and those little wheat curl mites, the ones that transmit that virus, are looking for a new host. And they migrate from that drying down wheat into volunteer wheat that might emerge after harvest, and they'll survive there. And that essentially serves as this green bridge until they can affect the emerging wheat crop in the fall. Well, that really completes what we call the green bridge. So if those mites move from that volunteer into that fall crop, then we've had the green bridge. But recently, we've been getting reports of wheat that's emerged now. So some we had some really dry conditions, and there's some volunteer wheat that's been coming up um, actually in the spring. And so producers have started to ask, well, is this the green bridge, and should I be worried about wheat streak mosaic? And so we here at K-State Research and Extension recommend that this is actually not the green bridge. So this might be a risk for some curl mites, especially if wheat streak has been a problem in the past. But this isn't as big of a risk as that summer emerged volunteer. So there might be some reasons that this would be managed, but it's not a bigger risk than the other um, wheat that's already out there in the landscape. So put that fear to rest right away that this in and of itself will not trigger wheat streak mosaic. Now, there might be some lingering effects of wheat streak from the fall infestations of the wheat curl mite. Sure. So right now that we're getting into the spring, those wheat curl mites are starting to become active again. So they'll start to reproduce quickly, especially when the temperatures are getting higher. And so they'll do that both on production wheat and on volunteer wheat. So there's about an equal risk between that volunteer and production wheat. So maybe there could be cases where destroying that uh, volunteer wheat could lower those curl mite populations in areas that are really um, highly infested. So if that's a worry, that does break up the landscape a little bit. But that has to be balanced with other agronomic decisions. And let's get right to those and bring Sarah in. The volunteer in and of itself can be taken care of if one wants to go to the trouble. That's the gist of it, isn't it? 
Right. So, you know, if you decide that you need to get rid of this volunteer wheat, it's, you know, really going to be a pretty straightforward thing. The most cost effective thing to do is going to be just to make an application of glyphosate. Now, a couple of caveats to that. One would be we're kind of in a we've had some warm daytime temperatures, but I think the short term forecast is to have a little bit cooler weather. So just being aware of those environmental conditions and how that affects herbicide efficacy um, could be important. But another thing to think about in terms of what do you want to do with this wheat? And if you decide to control it, how do you want to control it? You need to think about where this field is going to go later this summer. And so, you know, maybe you do want to try to control some other weeds that are out there. Um, So maybe you're going to add a 2,4-D or some other inexpensive product to that tank mix. Or maybe you want to um, go with something that has a bit of residual activity. And then that, of course, needs to be dependent upon what your your summer crop is going to be going into that field. You might expand on that. What degree of residual restrictions are there depending on what you might go with on that acreage, whether it be corn, grain, sorghum, soybeans? So, you know, one of the things that we could do to enhance the wheat control would be to use some atrazine. Um, And that's going to pretty much limit you, of course, to corn or grain sorghum on those acres. Other things that you might want to think about could be herbicides like Canopy or Sharpen. But again, regardless of the residual herbicide that you choose, you're going to want to go back and double check that rotation restriction um, against your plans for the summer because um, there's a lot of options out there. So you just want to make sure that you have the right information. Sarah, if one is concerned about spraying, that volunteer, and the subsequent management considerations that you just mentioned, they could go a non-chemical route, perhaps? You know, non-chemical termination would be an option. Um, again, that's going to be dependent um, to some extent on the the system that they're in. So, you know, something like tillage, if that's in your, in your plans. Another kind of approach to this, Eric, might be to, to think of this wheat that has emerged this spring almost like a cover crop. Right. So it is in some ways giving you some benefit out there. Right. It's it's cover that you can maybe graze later if you wanted to and then just come in and, and terminate it closer to the time of planting if it's not going to be an issue for those disease considerations or, or alternate hosts for a, an insect. And that really is part of the puzzle here, Kelsey. If, in fact, Wheat Streak Mosaic has had a history on that acreage, Uh, This extra volunteer, as you said, could just enhance that green bridge that much further. So kind of a judgment call. Sure thing. Yeah. So if that if there's a history of wheat streak or if you're already starting to see wheat streak show up in that volunteer or in neighboring fields, that's when it's going to be a risk to some of the the nearby fields within within a mile radius, basically, of where that volunteer is or where it where the production fields are. So that that would be where you would really start to be worried about about that volunteer staying out there. If Wheat Streak Mosaic does set into the cash crop, not just the volunteer, but to the uh, the main event here, if you will, what can be done at this point? Yep. So it, it depends on when. So one, the first thing is to confirm that we have Wheat Streak Mosaic. So we have a plant disease diagnostic lab. I'll put in a little plug for that here. We test for five different viruses in wheat, and those results basically come out every week, so we run those panels. And that is good to just confirm, because there are other things that can cause yellowing wheat, and we want to just make sure if it is um, wheat streak that we, we know what we're dealing with, right? And then it comes down to when that infection shows up. So if it shows up early in, in the season, that might be a higher risk to our yield and to our neighboring wheat than For example, wheat streak that shows up in the summer or in a couple of months. Also, we want to think about how much of the field's affected. So that's going to really um, determine how much yield loss we're going to see in that field. So early infections have a higher chance of yield loss, really high amount of infection in the field. That's a good chance for yield loss. And then we want to check the variety, too. If it's something that we know has some resistance to the virus or to the curl mite, we might have a better chance of salvaging that. But if not, it might be harder to get the yield potential out of that crop when we have these early infections. So those are really the things to think through uh, when we find wheat streak mosaic in our field. And as far as a fungicide response, we're still wanting 
in that area? Yeah, unfortunately, the the bad news is fungicides won't work for wheat streak mosaic virus. Once a plant's infected, it will stay infected for the, the rest of the season. You mentioned sampling, turning in that sample to the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory. There are a few basic ground rules for doing that sampling in and of itself, you say. Sure thing. So the best the best thing that we can get is a plant that's in good shape because then we can really figure out what's wrong with it. So it's always good to um, we have you can go right to plantpath.kstate.edu slash extension slash diagnostic lab. So that's a lot to <laughs> to remember there. Um, but you can fill out the form. So give us as much information as possible about distribution in the field. Photos are always great. You can email them to clinic at ksu.edu. And then it's really important that we get um, the whole plant. So we want the roots and we want leaf tissue, several plants that display a a range of symptoms. And we want to make sure we shake off as much soil as possible and get as much moisture out of that bag as possible. Because once we get a plant that has a lot of soil or a lot of moisture, it can really degrade the quality and make it a little harder for us to tell what's going on. So those are some of the big things to think about when submitting those samples to get the best results back. And if producers didn't catch all of that as far as the pathway to submitting samples, their local extension agricultural agent can help them along with that. That's always the best stop is is go right to your your county um, or local extension agent and they can definitely help submit these samples. The main message here is this new flush of volunteers spring emerged will not likely aggravate the wheat streak mosaic problem. Yes, that's the main message. Yep. Very well. Good to hear on that score. Thanks, Kelsey. We appreciate the input on that. And Sarah, if you'd stand by, we'll have you back after the break. We'd like to talk more in a broader sense about weed control in that wheat crop, even as we get ever closer to the next stage of development of that crop. Kelsey Anderson with us, wheat disease specialist with K-State Research and Extension, along with weed management specialist at K-State, Sarah Lancaster. We'll be back with Sarah after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Agriculture Today returns now, as does weed management specialist Sarah Lancaster of K-State Research and Extension. As promised, we want to take a closer look here at spring applied herbicide programs for that winter wheat crop. And we do have, as usual, Sarah, weed growth taking shape in wheat stands around Kansas. But what we'll get into today is all about the timing and the product selection, right? That's right. So as a weed scientist, I often encourage individuals to scout their fields to look for weeds. This time, I'm encouraging folks to scout their fields for a different reason. As you think about your weed management programs, you have to be aware of the stage of development of your weed. And so when we put the e-update article together, Eric, we kind of chunked the options into three different timings. So things that can be applied prior to jointing, things that can be applied through the boot stage, and things that can be applied through the flag leaf stage. We're starting to get to that time of the year where the wheat is starting to joint. And so it's going to be pretty important for folks to to double check um, that growth stage before they run out to the field with the sprayer. At last look, according to the National Ag Statistics Service, 10 percent of the wheat crop in Kansas has jointed. So these first options we'll discuss, if one is going to put them to use, they're going to have to do so right away, Sarah. Let's talk of what applications are permitted by the label prior to that jointing stage stage of winter wheat? Sure. So one of the more cost-effective and more popular options in this time frame is going to be dicamba. So dicamba can be applied between the two-leaf growth stage and jointing. So you want to be careful, again, not to apply that after jointing, or you will um, be likely to see some crop injury, particularly if the crop is stressed for other reasons. 
So things that dicamba is good at controlling would be things like kochia or wild buckwheats. But if you're looking at mustard control, we're going to want to look at 2,4-D instead of dicamba. And 2,4-D we'll get to in in a few minutes when we talk about some other things. It has a little bit different restrictions. Now, as we're looking at applications ahead of jointing, it's worth singling out here, Sarah, that there are these new wheat technologies, herbicide-resistant wheats, the applications of herbicide to which do have to, by all means, be put on before the jointing stage. Right. So as we think about our two herbicide-resistant types of wheat, we can apply the herbicide beyond to clear field wheats, and that can go on any time after tiller initiation and prior to jointing. If you're thinking about um, single gene clear field wheats. If you have the the two gene clear field wheats, however, you can apply until the second node um, is at the soil surface. And then the other um, herbicide resistant system that we have available is coaxium wheat. And the herbicide that is labeled for that system is called aggressor. And aggressor can be applied after the four leaf growth stage, but before jointing. So um, just again, some things to think about there in terms of, you know, making sure you have the right product and the right system and making your applications at the right time. And there's a whole list of other herbicides that must go on ahead of joining as well. So read the label. It always comes back to that, right, sir? <laughs> read the label. That's right. We joke about an extension about the answer is it depends. If you're a weed scientist, the answer is read the label. Very well. About applications that are allowed as late as through the boot stage of wheat development. Now we get into more alternatives, right? Right. So I mentioned 2,4-D earlier, and so 2,4-D can be applied through the boot stage. Um, We should be past one of the other really key uh, points for applying 2,4-D, and that is to make sure that you have full tiller development in your wheat crop. Because if you apply 2,4-D too soon, it can reduce tillering. And, you know, in some situations, we really need to depend on those tillers um, to produce maximum yields. So another product that is in that same family of chemistries is MCPA. Um, and MCPA can be applied a little earlier, but it also has a cutoff of boot stage for the last application timing. Another plant growth regulating herbicide that has um, an application cutoff of boot stage is Starane. Um, and so products that contain fluoroxapyr, um, which is the active ingredient in starane, could be something that you want to look at if you're in a situation where kochia um, is a problem. So those plant growth regulating herbicides, 2,4-D, MCPA, and starane, um, are some of the big ones to look at as far as having an application cut off at the boot stage. Having mentioned 2,4-D and MCPA, are there drift concerns that need to be factored in to those applications? You know, drift is always a concern when we're thinking about herbicide applications. Um, We've had some particularly windy conditions here um, this spring. um, Say the least. To say, (laughs) not a surprise when you live in Kansas. Um, But uh, drift is always a concern, and just making sure that you're monitoring expected wind speeds. Um, at the time of application. There are a lot of particularly ornamentals and high-value crops that are very sensitive to herbicides like 2,4-D and dicamba. Um, They've made a lot of news in the summer um, in terms of dicamba movement. There's a a resource for folks called Driftwatch. Um, It's an online resource that folks can check. You can register your sensitive crops, and then as as an applicator, you can check to see if there are sensitive crops in the area. If opting for, say, 2,4-D or MCPA, the formulation type would be important here with the drift consideration in mind here, Sarah. Yeah, so there's lots of things that that formulation can affect in terms of of 2,4-D use. So drift, esters are more prone to volatility and off-target movement than amine formulations. Um, However, ester formulations tend to be considered to be a little more efficacious than amine formulations. Um, There's also considerations in terms of compatibility with tank mixes and and using fertilizer as a carrier um, when you're choosing those, uh, making that decision in terms of choosing your your formulation there. Now, some products can be put on wheat, actively growing, even as late as the flag leaf stage? There are a few products um, that can be applied through um, flag leaf. So that gives you a, a quite a window there to to determine um, if you need to make that herbicide application or not. One that I'd like to draw some attention to just because it's newer um, is a product called Pixaro. 
and it's labeled for control of some, some things that we struggle with, flixweed, horseweed, kochia, buckwheat, for example. And then there's a, a list of, of other products. Mine include things like Harmony that could also be applied through flag leaf. Above everything, though, producers need to be out in their stands now getting a first-hand glance at to whatever weed infestations are turning up. Hopefully their stands are progressing to the point now, Sarah, where the wheat can compete very well against those. But we all know that there are often exceptions. Absolutely. Like I said at the top, scouting is the key, knowing what you've got to work with. And if one would like to get a full scope of the options for treating wheat at this stage of the growing season or in the subsequent weeks, they can check out this year's edition of K-State's Chemical Weed Control Guide for field crops, pastures, and non-cropland that can be found online at the K-State Research and Extension Bookstore or inquire about it at your local extension office, as always. And Sarah, thanks for the word right here. We'll have you back again soon and talk some other aspect of crop weed control, undoubtedly. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Eric. We'll look forward to coming back. She's a weed management specialist at K-State Research and Extension. Sarah Lancaster, along with us on Agriculture Today. And we should mention again right here that Sarah is a co-host of a new and increasingly popular podcast which covers in depth a wide spectrum of crop weed management topics. She and peers from fellow land grant universities post this War Against Weeds podcast weekly, and it's easily found by searching for it by title War Against Weeds. It's a great product. Check it out, producers. And on another note of interest, if you're a commercial pesticide applicator, Still short on hours to renew your license, or you just want to get your credits renewed this year, the Kansas State Pesticide Safety Program is providing a training opportunity coordinated by K-State Research and Extension this month of April for several of the categories to help individuals renew. This training will be offered in a virtual format via Zoom, and these will be the only trainings offered by the program this spring. They are as follows, April the 21st and 22nd, covering the categories right-of-way, industrial weed, and noxious weed control. Then on April the 28th and 29th, the categories of forestry, ornamental, turf, and interior scape, pesticide applications. And lastly, on April the 30th, agriculture plant applications. More information can be found at the K-State Research and Extension website, ksre.ksu.edu slash pesticides dash IPM, or contact K-State's Franny Miller directly, fmiller at ksu.edu. You can inquire as well at your local Extension office, of course. Again, pesticide applicator training opportunities coming up later on in this month of April. Now we'll stand aside for a few moments. When we come back after the break, we'll get into today's agricultural news headlines for you. Also, Greg Akagi awaits with this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. It'll feature one of K-State's own. Be listening for that. And further ahead, this week's horticulture segment, as we'll get caught up on insect activity already getting after it in our home landscape, woody ornamentals, and what to do about those. All of that yet to come here on... The K-State Radio Network. Please keep it right here. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. You're listening to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. President Biden more aggressively defended his $2.3 trillion infrastructure package yesterday, saying the plan and its funding are open to negotiation. 
But he also stressed the investments are needed to compete with China and other countries going forward. Now, Biden's plan largely has gotten lukewarm support among major agricultural groups. Organizations such as the American Farm Bureau Federation have raised concerns over the tax increases, while biofuel backers are at odds over hundreds of billions in proposed investment to spur more electric vehicles. To pay for the American Jobs Plan, as it's called, Biden proposes increasing the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent. Now, Republicans have criticized the broad scope of the package being defined as an infrastructure bill. Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa opened a press conference with reporters yesterday saying that the plan, quoting here, is very lacking in a lot of things important to rural America, in his words. Grassley said too much of the bill goes to things beyond traditional infrastructure. Looking at the Biden plan from a transportation perspective, the executive director of the Soy Transportation Transportation Coalition, Mike Steenhoek, said that the bill calls attention to some needs in rural America, such as the push to improve 10,000 bridges in rural areas. Steenhoek said that farmers have a real understanding about the importance of improving those rural bridges. The plan also includes a $17 billion amount specific carved out for inland waterways, ports, and ferries, but does not specify how that would be divvied up. Groups such as the Waterways Council would like to see continued upgrades to lock and dam infrastructure. Now, the Farm Bureau sees important priorities for agriculture and rural communities, it says, in the administration's infrastructure plan. But raising taxes, particularly when the country is trying to emerge from the pandemic, is, as they put it, a misguided idea. That's from an AFBF spokesperson stated to DTN. The federation, they said, has long advocated for expanding rural access to broadband and supports rebuilding crumbling roads, bridges, ports, waterways and water systems, as well as research funding all of which are included in the bill. The plan also proposes a rural partnership program specifically to help rural regions, and they say that they look forward to learning more about that. The Farm Bureau, though, wants more details on where the Biden administration plans to take climate smart farming, which is also part of the infrastructure plan, and any plan they say should be accompanied and accomplished with careful consideration, responsible funding, and bipartisan support. Grants were recently awarded to land-grant universities researching how to develop advanced tools to transfer agricultural and food-based data into practical applications. The USDA's Rod Bain has more on that. Ever heard of cyber informatics? Cyber informatics is just a fancy word for working with data over computer networks. And Stephen Thompson of USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture says grants were recently awarded to 18 food and agriculture cyber informatics and tools research projects. Over $10 million in grant monies total, focusing on aspects ranging from big data analytics to predictive technologies. How can we use this data for advancing agriculture? One example among recent grant awardees is developing an artificial intelligence-based decision support system to identify pest and small grain crops and, in turn, create specific integrated pest management systems. Thompson adds, incidentally, the Food and Ag Cyber Informatics and Tools FACT grant program is undergoing a name change going forward to be called Data Science for Food and Agricultural Systems. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the U.S. Grains Council has now published its 2021 Sorghum Quality Report. And for the second year in a row, U.S. Sorghum was, on average, graded above the necessary requirements for U.S. number 1. Protein content in sorghum up 8% year over year. Readings coming in at 11.2%, almost a full percentage point jump over last year's content. This report is funded by the USDA, provides international customers and other interested parties accurate and unbiased information about the quality of the 2020 U.S. sorghum crop. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Guy Allen is joining us. He is the Senior Economist 
with the International Grains Program at Kansas State University. And Guy, for what we have seen so far in uh, soybeans, as far as prices and where we have been going with it in 2021, what have we seen so far and what are we expecting for the rest of 2021? Well, we've seen uh, prices reach new highs and then uh, fade, fade away a bit. And look, I'd suggest soybeans still need to buy some new crop acres. We're starting to see some planting in reports coming out of the southern states, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, even as uh, planting commences under there. Look, the new crop, old crop spread with a $2 inverse between those values is going to be quite interesting how that comes together before we get to new crop. So it's, it's interesting times. What are we seeing as far as uh, or hearing about with Brazil? And of course, China has been such in the news for them. Looking at the exporting countries first, look, Brazil's harvest is about 78% complete, which is good. Their second crop corn planted are pretty much done. We did get some freezing temperatures in Europe, which impacts the rapeseed crop. And that rapeseed crop and canola coming out of Canada is, is quite important, particularly with the high oil prices that we're seeing driving and lending support to the soybean days. We got to keep in mind canola and rapeseed is anywhere from 42 to 40 percent oil compared to soybeans, about 18, 19 percent. Moving on to China, look, that's where we're really focused at the moment is on that Chinese demand. That's the big unknown question. The big driver there is the African swine fever situation. As we continue to try to guesstimate what it's doing to the hog herds, we're hearing uh, scattered rumors on a frequent basis of outbreaks as they continue to try to keep that disease under control. But we're seeing indications more from the coarse grain side with strong corn imports as well as heavy wheat feeding into China. Imported wheat values in China are actually less than domestic corn prices. So we're seeing a significant level of wheat feeding in China, which is keeping me fairly optimistic that the hog numbers are there. We did see some new exports this week of about 4 million bushel soybeans, but we did see some cancellations of about 2.5 million as well. Look, with the improving crush margins in China, that has to keep you uh, fairly optimistic there as well. All right, Guy, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Very good. That is Guy Allen, who is the senior economist with the International Grains Program at Kansas State University. He joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Many thanks, Greg. Greg Akagi there, and we'll return shortly with more on Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Agriculture Today continues now with our weekly horticulture segment, and the spring is certainly settled in now, so it's high time we have brought back by horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd. Haven't visited with him for a while because during the winter, insect activity is at a bare minimum, but welcome back, Raymond, because you have several pests you want to share information on with us today, and Mm -hmm. they're getting after it. Pine sawfly. Those with pine trees in their landscapes need be concerned about this pest, right? Yes, Eric. First of all, I say glad to be back. And uh, we do have a number of uh, arthropod insect or mite pests to talk about. The European pine sawfly it looks like a caterpillar, but it's not. It's a sawfly. But the larvae about this time of year start feeding on the needles of uh, pine trees, different types, mugo pine and others. And if they go unchecked, they can strip the needles off and the pines won't look very nice. Uh, what you can do, you can either pick them off, you can use a high-pressure water spray to blast them off, or just spray with a common contact insecticide. Now, remember, there is a product called Dipel. It contains the bacteria Bacillus, Thuringiensis, Kerastache. Remember, that is for caterpillars. The European pine sawfly is not a caterpillar, it's a sawfly. So don't use that product. Uh, Use ones that are registered for sawflies. So it'll feed on the needles, it'll cause damage. Is this 
sawfly a vector of disease in any way by chance? No, no, we're lucky. Uh, uh, most of the sawflies are not vectors of disease, Eric. But you know, again, it's one of you know we can we group them into early season insect and mite pests, mid and then later. These are one of the early season ones, and if the temperatures remain like they are, uh, they should be showing up or. If they may be showing up right now on pine trees, yeah. So if you want to maintain the cosmetic appearance of your pines, do take a look at controlling pine sawfly if there's evidence of that pest. And another evergreen pest you wanted to bring to our attention, too, the spruce spider mite, Raymond? Yes, yes, Eric. There are two types of mites. There are cool season mites and then there are warm season mite. The two-spotted spider mite is our warm season mite. We see that in the summertime feeding on tomatoes and burning bushes and things like that. But in the fall and the uh, and uh, early spring, like right now, we have the spruce spider mite, which basically feeds on thuyas and conifers. And you'll notice the bronzing, the browning. Uh, what you can do is just take a piece of white paper, attach to a clipboard, uh, shake a couple branches, and you should see the mites on there. They're distinctly red. And again, you can use a high-pressure water spray to blast them off very easily. You can apply like a, an oil, a horticultural oil or insecticidal soap which have minimal impact on your pollinators and beneficial insects, and that's why we recommend them. So uh, this is the time where the spruce spider mite will be active, and, of course, during the summertime, it'll go through hibernation, and that's when the two-spotted spider mite becomes a problem. Be on the watch for those as well, then. Again, the spruce spider mite. Now, a pest which may not be as evident externally because it is a bore is something you want to remind landscape managers about, homeowners. The lilac ash borer, it's going to likely be active here soon, Raymond? Yeah, if not already, the, the lilac, uh, actually it's lilac slash ash borer, but it's a uh, one, it's a, it's a caterpillar borer. The, the moths are clearing moths, and uh, the female lays eggs on the bark of the, the tree, and the eggs, well, the larva hatches, in this case it is a caterpillar, tunnels into the plant, and then starts feeding on the internal contents, primarily the, the cambium and the phloem tissues. And your plants can't take up water nutrients. So one thing you can do is to keep your plants healthy, but right now, if you have a history, apply like a insecticide with the active ingredient permethrin. It's a pyrethroid, and that creates a barrier. So when the larvae emerge from the eggs, they run into the barrier and are killed. Once they're inside the plant, the tree, it's much more difficult to deal with them. And uh, later on in the year, you'll see these papery cases protruding out from your tree, and those are the pupa of the, the lilac borer basically. So right now, you probably want to think about putting that barrier on if you have a history of lilac borers attacking your lilac or ash trees. Yeah. So get on that rather expediently. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, this this is the month to think about that because this is typically when we start seeing uh, lilac borer activity. Yeah. And the eastern tent caterpillar, which we've spoken of multiple times over the years, they are quite evident when they get active. Yes. If you're out there uh, driving around and you see your, your uh, apple or plum or pear with this uh, silken nest in it, that's like the eastern tent caterpillar. And the eastern tent caterpillar is an early defoliator. They come out during the daytime, feed on leaves, and they go back at night into the, the nest. And one of the easiest ways to deal with them is just take a rake or your a glove and break up the nest. And the, the birds will go in there because the birds are, birds are hungry. They'll go in and eat, eat them. And it's a nice warm area because there's lots of caterpillar poop in it or, or <laughs> fecal material. Once they're in the nest, it's hard to get on with insecticide, so that's why physical disruption is probably hand picking is also evident. But uh, if you do see these nests in your trees, it's probably best to either have a high pressure water spray and disrupt them or destroy them as soon as possible. And we would like to remind Raymond that uh, there are tons of extension resources for homeowners, for gardeners, on all manner of horticultural insects. And you've even added a few to the list of late. Yes. Yeah, so number one, we, our entomology, extension entomology newsletter is now available. We just had the first issue last week. We'll have a second issue. I will have an article on Eastern Tin Caterpillar and others to look out for, European pine sawfly, lilac, ash borer, spruce spider mite. We put together a lot of extension publications, and I'll just list them off. Pine tortoise scale, San Jose scale, woolly apple aphid, striped and spotted cucumber beetle, Colorado potato beetle, white flies, elm leaf beetle, 
cross-striped cabbage worm, Japanese beetle updated, and bagworm. We've updated that one. In addition, a, a really popular one is insects and mite pests of vegetable gardens. It has a table with images of the insects and plants they attack, and then a scale insect pests. So there's a whole plethora of new ones, great color images, easy text in there, and so we're very we're, we're, we're really proud of these. And so, again, we've expanded the portfolio of our fact sheets through the bookstore. You can download them, and, and they're there. you got a color printer. you get the color images. Just go to the K-State Research and Extension Bookstore. Search for that by name. You'll find those resources. And having listed all those, Raymond, we'll have plenty to discuss in subsequent visits. I think we will, Eric. I think we will, yes. <laughs> Good to have you back by. We'll Thank get you. together again next month and catch up on the latest lawn and garden insects around Kansas. Yes. And lastly, it's not time to spray for bagworms. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> we'll get to that That's in right. due time. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, Eric. Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away once again. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.